What is the accommodation reflex? Well, well, it, it's, it's this. When you bring an object uh, close to your eyes, three things happen. Um, your eyes point inwards. We have convergence. So both eyes point inwards towards that object that's getting closer to your face. Um, the lens inside your eye fattens to focus the light reflected by that object onto your retina so that you can focus on it, you can see the detail in it, and your pupils constrict. That's the accommodation reflex or the accommodation and convergence reflex. I have talked about the anatomy of this reflex before, but we're going to talk about the neuroanatomy. We're going to go all the way back to the occipital lobes and we're going to have a look at the midbrain, the brain stem, look at the nuclei in there and talk about the reflex in a little bit more detail and why it's useful to know about it clinically. Whenever we talk about a reflex, we talk about three parts. We talk about the sensory bit, we talk about the relay or the reflex bit, and then we talk about the motor bit. So we should start with the eye. Uh, so as I said, a light is going into the eye and it's falling onto the retina. So the retina then is the sensory part of the reflex. So the light is captured by the retina and this is different to the pupillary light response where um, there are cells in the retina that are detecting the level of light and sending that information back to the brain to realize that you want to focus on something nearby. That's, that's quite a bit more complicated. So a lot of information, like the, the visual information from the retina is collected and sent back through the optic nerve. The optic nerve is a big nerve, carries that information to the back of the orbit, goes through the optic canal, and then the optic nerves from both eyes will meet at the optic chiasm. Here's the brain. Now the left and right optic nerves come together at the optic chiasm, this crossing here, and some of the fibers will cross from one side of the body to the other, and some will stay on that side. Uh, so the optic chiasm is here, and then I need to dissect this brain a little bit. And then those bundles of neurons run from the optic chiasm um, around. So here's the brain stem here. There's the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. But right now, the optic tract is running around kind of the top of that. And it's going to run to the thalamus. So the thalamus um, is the sensory relay, like the sensory sieve. It determines what's relevant and tells the higher centers about it. It either cuts out that sensory input so you're not aware of it, or it sends it onto the higher centers so you are aware of it. But the optic tract runs to the lateral geniculate nucleus. And the lateral geniculate nucleus, there's one on either side, is part of the thalamus. There's one on either side. And then from the lateral geniculate nucleus, um, optic radiation, so neurons pass out to the occipital lobe, the back of the brain here, the posterior part of the brain, and inside the occipital lobe, that's where we have the visual centers and some of the visual processing centers. So that's the sensory input from the retina. We're back here. It's not just a relay that's going to the midbrain, it's a relay that's actually going to the visual centers of the cortex because this is more complex than just detecting light or dark. Now, as far as I'm aware, the exact site of this reflex, this relay, is not entirely known. But the occipital lobe, this is where the accommodation reflex occurs. So the sensory inputs go in, and then the outputs from the visual cortex go to the midbrain. So now we're in the midbrain, and in the midbrain, this is where we find the neurons that drive the muscles of the eye, the muscles around the eye and the muscles inside the eye. So in the midbrain here, we can see a couple of lumps posteriorly. Here's the cerebral aqueduct running through it. Uh, the tectum is a region of the midbrain that is posterior to, that's dorsal to, the cerebral aqueduct. So this is the tectum. And in the tectum, we see these little lumps, the, the superior lumps 
uh, are the superior colliculi, there's one on the left, one on the right, and the inferior lumps are the inferior colliculi, there's one on the left, one on the right, and the superior colliculus is involved in coordinating movements of the eye. Largely, most of the movements of your eye are unconscious. Your, your eye is constantly moving to build up a picture of the world, or it's fixed on something while you're moving so you can you can fix on something, but when you're reading a book and your eyes are flicking across a page, when you look at somebody's face and they're flicking between the eyes and the mouth and the nose and you're building up a picture of the face, you don't notice that this is happening most of the time. Um, but the superior colliculus, in association with the cerebellum and other parts of the cerebrum, they're coordinating these automatic eye movements, these saccadic eye movements. Um, to build up a picture of the world. So the superior colliculus is going to receive inputs as part of the accommodation reflex from the occipital lobe. And if this is the tectum, then if you're coming at the midbrain from an anterior position, from a ventral position, uh, the bit of the midbrain you get to just before you get to the tectum is called the pretectum or the pretectal areas. And in the pretectal areas, we find other nuclei. To look at this in another way, we can look at transverse sections. So there's the thalamus. Ah, okay. There's the midbrain. There's a little lump posteriorly there. There's the superior colliculus. We can see a hole there. That's the cerebral aqueduct. Around the cerebral aqueduct, there is a little bit of gray matter. That's the periaqueductal peri gray. Okay, so the colliculi are in the tectum. So the pretectal area is just before the tectum. So the superior colliculi and the pretectal areas are receiving inputs from the occipital cortex as part of the accommodation reflex. And then in here, very nearby, in the midbrain, we have the oculomotor nucleus, which is a collection of ne neuron cell bodies that are um, somatic motor neurons. They're gonna innervate the skeletal muscles that move the eye, and you can choose to move your eye. Um, so those are, those are somatic motor fibers. And right next to them, we have the Edinger-Westphal nucleus. The Edinger-Westphal nucleus, or nuclei, because there's one on either side, are parasympathetic nuclei. That is, they are the nerve cell bodies, the neuron cell bodies of preganglionic parasympathetic neurons that are going to run to the eye and do parasympathetic jobs. Constriction of the pupil is a parasympathetic response. Um, and the fattening of the lens is a parasympathetic thing. We'll come to that as we get there. So with the accommodation reflex, those inputs into the midbrain at this level from the visual cortex are going to drive some of the somatic motor neurons of the ocular motor nucleus um, to move the eyes. And they're going to innovate, they're going to drive some of those preganglionic parasympathetic motor neurons. Uh, of the edinger westphal nucleus, and all of those neurons will leave the midbrain as part of the oculomotor nerve, uh, cranial nerve three. Why, why have I got all the heavy models today? All right, so big eye. So there's the eye, there's the brain in there. The great big nerve, that shows you how huge it is. That's the, the optic nerve there, the big boy. Um, the oculomotor nerve, um, is going to run through the superior orbital fissure to get into the orbit. So it's running towards the eye. Um, now, the parasympathetic part, well, there's a rule, isn't there, that parasympathetic and sympathetic motor neurons are a two-neuron chain. That's why we talk about preganglionic parasympathetic neurons and postganglionic parasympathetic neurons. So those preganglionic parasympathetic neurons from the Edinger-Westphal nucleus will run to the ciliary... Uh, ganglion. So the ganglion then is the collection of postganglionic parasympathetic neuron cell bodies in the orbit. So the preganglionic parasympathetic neurons run to the ciliary ganglion and then postganglionic parasympathetic neurons run from the ciliary ganglion through the short ciliary nerves to get into the eye. And when they get into the eye, they can then run to the um, sphincter pupillae muscle, which will constrict the pupil 
and they can run to the um, ciliary, the, the ciliary muscle in the ciliary body. We'll come to those in a moment. Oh, that's a bit more manageable. So there's the eye. Now, um, we said that the ocular motor nerve is also carrying um, somatic skeletal motor output. So this muscle here, this is the medial rectus muscle. And the medial rectus muscle um, on both sides is going to contract. So the, the job of the um, somatic motor part of the ocular motor nerve and the accommodation reflex, that part is to innervate both medial rectus muscles, which will pull the eye, pull the, the vision, the gaze, the pupil medially. And that's what gives convergence. So ocular motor, somatic motor, convergence, medial rectus, all right? Now, if we look inside the eye, so those parasympathetic fibers are running around the eye. Um, here's the lens here, and here's the iris. And the sphincter pupillae muscle is, is part of the iris. Um, so the fibers are gonna run there. I think that one's fairly straightforward, right? Um, it's a circular muscle, it's a sphincter. You tell the muscle to contract, the hole gets smaller, so the pupil gets smaller, so the pupil constricts, right? But the lens, around the lens, so around here, there's a, a ring, uh, the ciliary body, and within the ciliary body is the ciliary muscle. And the ciliary muscle, it's a ring. I keep saying it because it's an important idea. And the lens is suspended from the ciliary body by these fibers. So that means, often counterintuitively, that if the muscle is relaxed, the lens is actually stretched by those fibers, which means the lens is thin and flat, which is great for focusing on distant objects. Um, but to focus on a, a near object, um, parasympathetic innovation causes the ciliary muscle to contract, which means that that ring gets smaller. Um, so the tension between those fibers and the lens is reduced, so the lens relaxes and can become fatter. So the fatter lens is better, well, it will then focus light from a near object onto the retina. Um, so that is the motor part of accommodation. Uh, medial rectus, convergence, um, parasympathetic fibers to sphincter pupillae, constrict the pupil, and parasympathetic fibers to the ciliary muscle causes the lens to contract. Uh, the, the lens to relax, shorten, and fatten. Why is this anatomy useful? Why do you need to know all this? Well, um, like other things you test with the eye, it's an easy test, and it can tell you a lot about what's going on inside the cranial cavity. Um, that's the test, and you can test convergence, so you can test that both medial rectus muscles work, and work fully and evenly, because there are various problems with ocular muscles that um, come about. Um, and when you're doing this test, because you only need your finger or a pencil and you just ask someone to follow my finger and you move the finger closer to within a few centimeters of your face, it's a very easy test to do. And you're looking for convergence and you're looking for constriction of the pupil. Um, so not only does it tell you that the reflex is intact, but it also it tells you that the parasympathetic innervation is intact if the pupil constricts. The fun thing here is that, um, you know, the pupillary light response, so you shine a light in someone's eye and the pupil constricts. They're different reflexes, and the sensory bit and the reflex bit are in, actually, they're different. The motor bit's the same, the parasympathetic outflow bit causing pupillary constriction is the same, but the other parts of the reflex are different. So in some pathology, um, the pupillary light response is absent, as in you shine a light in someone's eyes and the pupil doesn't constrict, but in that same person, you can do the accommodation, you can test the accommodation reflex and their pupil will constrict. Um, the really common part about all of this is uh, presbyopia. So since I recorded the original video, where I didn't go into as much detail with the neuroanatomy, but I talked about the anatomy of accommodation and convergence, my eyesight has got worse. Over the age of 40, particularly over the age of 50, uh, presbyopia is so common as to be normal. What this is, is, is a loss of, or 
um, a reduced ability to focus on objects that are near. So you're losing your near visual acuity. It gets harder to read books. Um, and the reason for this is because I said that when the ciliary muscle contracts that ring, the lens relaxes, as in the tension on the, on the, the, the cords that were stretching the lens is reduced. So the lens relaxes into a fatter shape and that's what focuses the light onto the, the retina. Um, but probably because of changes to the composition of the lens with age, that doesn't happen as quickly as it used to or doesn't happen at all. The lens doesn't change shape. It's not being pulled by a muscle. It's not being stretched. It's the opposite. The tension is being taken off it. So it needs to settle into that, into that position that focuses the light properly on the retina so that you can read. That doesn't work as well when you get older. Much of our connected tissues throughout our body don't work as well as they did uh, when we get older. And this is part of that. And this is why older people need reading glasses. Now, the other thing we've been talking about is pupillary constriction. Why does that occur? Well, um, pupi a constricted pupil um, gives better vision, basically. So if you've got a camera, if you take photos, your photos will likely be sharper at f11 which is quite a small aperture, than f2.8, which is quite a wide aperture, a small aperture. You have a greater depth of field. You see how I'm in focus, but the stuff in the background isn't in focus. That's because we have a shallow depth of field. I'm at f2.8 now. Um, but if you're taking, doing landscape photography, you'll be taking photos at f8 or f11. A smaller hole, a smaller aperture, gives a greater depth of field. The image is sharper. Think of pinhole cameras of the olden days. Um, and there's less aberration. So as the light is passing through these elements, in fact, the, the other parts of the eye are doing a lot of the focusing of the light, but as the light is passing through these elements, you get aberration, you get fringing, you get a little bit of uh, effects on the light. So the image is not as good a quality with a wide open hole as a constricted aperture. So the pupillary constriction helps you focus on the object that's close to your face. But of course, if you're making the hole smaller, less light is getting onto the retina. The, the retina only has so much sensitivity, so you've got all these things in play. Um, so if you're trying to read something close up and you're struggling to focus on it, add more light. Um, if you have presbyopia, you might actually find that when you're outside, you can focus on near objects, you can read your phone a lot more easily than you can inside. That's because it's brighter. So that pupillary constriction helps you focus the light reflected from the near object on your retina. The convergence of your eyes helps you point both of those retinas and lenses and what have you at that object that's now close to your face. And the, the lens changes shape to also focus that reflected light on your retina. But you can at least take, take advantage of the pupillary constricted bit. Add more light, it might help your vision. But of course, this can be easily fixed with glasses. This is why reading glasses are so common in older people. Anyway, the eye, as always, fascinating anatomy. Um, Hopefully I've added to your knowledge a little bit and you found that as interesting as I did. See you next week.